Okay, and Jason, are you good on the video part of it? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it, for it, what we're it sounds do. good. To, if you're going to be using the mic, we'll be in great we're shape. Be thank you. It back and forth. You can keep that and just whatever. Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, my name is Randy Bishop. I'm with Patriot Voice Radio. We'll have you guys say basically the same thing, but for you. Um, I ran for state senate in 2010 against Howard Walker. We're uh, engaged in this very, very important uh, primary that's coming up, and that's why we took the time to come here today to do this event, and uh, appreciate you showing up. Again, my name's Randy Bishop, and I'll be moderating and asking the questions of the candidates that did show up. Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I think most of you know me, but I just want to take a moment to thank uh, Randy for this opportunity for this forum. Uh, I think all of us that have come uh, welcome this opportunity for you to get to know us a little bit better, uh, our core principles and values. Uh, I think we, the seated here, are, get along quite well, and I respect both of these gentlemen. I also want to thank the streeters, uh, this, this wonderful facility that has opened up its doors to multiple, uh, so many multiple times to conservative causes, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, I entered this race last November because um, I'm basically pretty chagrined with the way things are going. Uh, I don't, I really truly believe this, uh, that we're at a crossroads, ladies and gentlemen. And if we don't take a stand, a conservative stand, a principled stand, certainly now and in then up until 16 with the new president, our country will be lost. It will be not what we grew up with. And uh, we owe it to the future generations to try to do what we can to rectify that situation. And I look forward to your questions. I really feel that if you're not willing to take questions from this group or any group, you don't belong going to Lansing. Thank you. Rob. Hello, my name is Rob Henschel. Uh, another candidate for the 104th District State Representative representing Grand Traverse County. Um, the reason I'm running is I, I, I look at a lot of the politicians we send to Lansing and it just seems like they're just looking for a job, a career, some accolades. Uh, I'm, I'm just a local shopkeeper, uh, grew up in a family business, uh, you know, I grew up in my family's general store, and uh, I just want to go to Lansing and, and give some real uh, I guess ground level perspective. It seems like when we send people to Lansing, they kind of forget where they come from, and they they don't always think about us when they're voting. They think about who's writing them checks or who's buying them lunch. Um, so, and that's not to say I'll never get a check from a pack and or never you know have a luncheon that's uh, you know provided by uh, some more special interest. But when it's all said and done, I'm not looking for a career in politics. I'm not looking for a retirement to, you know, just kind of finish out my life uh, in politics. I'm, I'm looking to go down for a few years, uh, between one and three terms. And when I come back, whatever I create, I get to live with, because I'm going to come back and run a hardware store. And, um, you know, I've got a wonderful wife and three children here in, in Grand Traverse County, and we plan on living our lives here. And the other issue uh, that's going to be a concern to me is jobs. Uh, we see too many of our children, and, you know, in, in Michigan, our our biggest export seems to be our best and brightest. We're exporting our young talent. And I want, uh, I want to bring it about an economy where there is some great jobs in this area, and then if my kids want to live in this area where they grew up, they have that choice, they have that option. So that's a big concern to me as well, and that's why I'm running. All right, uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Matt Lundy. Um, I grew up around here. I uh, went to the University of Michigan. And uh, I worked for polit in politics for about three years in Washington and uh, Chicago. And uh, I also uh, taught English in Vietnam for four years uh, leading up to this. Um, I'm running because I want to shake things up. Um, I am really tired of us having uh, representatives that aren't very dynamic, that don't get our name out there, that fail to get us uh, well, what we really deserve and really did fail to stand up for the people of this area. Um, there's four main issues that, I, that I'm all about. The first is transparency. Um, if you're familiar with Justin Amash, uh, he's one of my big heroes. Uh, I want to put all my, my, face, my votes on Facebook. Um, I, wa I want to record lobbyist meetings. Uh, whatever a lobbyist has to say to me, they can say to you. Uh, you're my boss, so uh, that's that's kind of how that works. Um, 
I, uh, I want to get on the uh, regulatory and licensing committee because I'm so tired of all these uh, regulations that have been popping up and, and really just stifling commerce and, and economics and, uh, and quite frankly are, are just very anti-capitalist. Um, and I don't think people uh, who propose these regulations are yelled at enough, so uh, I certainly want to do that. Um, and then uh, education reform, I did teach for four years. Uh, I don't like Common Core. Um, not all kids are the same, especially at high school age. Uh, we need to be giving them more options like skilled trades um, and, and really promoting um, what jobs you can actually get as opposed to um, you know, going to college because that's not, an, uh, that's not necessarily good for, for everyone. Uh, finally, uh, I do want to increase exports in this state. There's a huge demand in Asia for, uh, for manufactured and agricultural goods from America. So this is really a way to change the tide of, uh, of commerce in our favor. So uh, that's, that's me, and thanks for this time. I was going to have all my mics set up for all the candidates, but with just an intimate setting here, I thought we'd just pass the mic back and forth. I want to go into just, um, and Eric, could I have my phone back, because I do have a timer on there, and I, and I want to be able to get through as many topics as possible. I appreciate you taking those pictures. Um, brief one-minute answers to questions. Um, throw out some topics that we've been talking about on the radio, Patriot Voice. I've been involved in a lot of meetings downstate with different committees and things. And there's a lot of issues, policies, uh, potential laws that may be coming up either this year uh, after the elections during the lame duck or after one of you get elected and are going to be sworn in. Um, I'd like to start off first with one that's kind of tied into us passing right to work. We were all very much engaged in getting that accomplished and that was a huge, huge thing for us to do. Um, I assume all of you support us becoming a right to work state. One of the other little laws, 1965 Public Act 166, was called Prevailing Wage Law. And if you don't know anything about it, just real quickly, uh, what it basically did is made all government construction jobs, roads, bridges, schools. Uh, how many of you have seen um, these trails that they've done on the rails and they have the little bathrooms and, and rest areas set up and things like that? Every single one of those jobs have to be bid at union scale. And a lot of our contractors up here, especially I've talked to Elmers here in Traverse City, they're road builders, and their guys don't get those union scales as their regular pay. Take one minute uh, just to basically explain what you think your position is on prevailing wage and, and whether you would support us repealing uh, that public act. And we'll start with Matt first down in that. Um, j just to be clear, this is the 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 act that says um, I believe it was. It, it basically makes it the roads have to have a union contract. Union scale. Union no, scale. You don't have to be a union shop, but you got to quote the bid at union scale. Okay. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, I mean, just in in general terms um, on things like this. Um, you know, I take I take a very I guess you'd say laissez-faire capitalist um, attitude toward this. I'm very uh, influenced by the Austrians. Um, if you know who those those guys are, Hayek, von Mises, and uh, they basically say keep the government out of it and things will go well. And for the most part, I've seen that when the government does stay out of things like this, things do go well. Okay, and uh, and that's uh, that's my that's my take on it. Is I just don't think the the, the government should be dictating wages uh, for anyone. Rob, thank you. Uh, good question. This is actually something I addressed on WTCM radio a couple weeks back, uh, and that is, you know, what do we do about our roads? And prevailing wage is one of the big things, in my view, that we need to take a look at. And give you an example. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fortunate to come from an industrious family. A lot of my you know, the Henschels and, and a lot of uh, the surrounding family are all entrepreneurs. Well, I have a great uncle that started a company and he did road striping. And uh, he, he would do for counties or, uh, you know, state roads. 
and he would hire the crew and pay them a fair wage they were willing to work for. And, but the, there was a problem when he went to do any work on a state highway where they were painting the stripes. Those same people that were willing to work for that wage had to be paid by law three or four dollars an hour more. So it cost more to when he bid the contract and the taxpayers paid more than they would have had to pay if it was a county road. Okay, that's the problem with prevailing wage. It takes out the fair economy. It takes out the, the fair trade. If someone's willing to pay a certain amount, that's what you should pay. No more just because it's for government. You shouldn't have to pay more. The taxpayer should not be charged more. So yeah, I am absolutely opposed to keeping prevailing wage. Uh, one caveat is federal roads. There's also federal uh, uh, prevailing wage laws we'll have to deal with in Lansing. Okay. I'm against uh, the prevailing wage. You know, this is something that's been coming up a little bit. We're just uh, skirting the issue on a board I serve, which is the Commission on Aging. And we have an instance where we have uh, a program called Home Chore. And Home Chore is uh, not really working out very well in that we have a, a ridiculously long wait list for services. And uh, additionally, uh, but we have union workers that only work four days a week, and it's in their contract to do that. Well, I have suggested that we look, we get some bids and contract out, and uh, of course we're being met by a lot of resistance from the union people. And uh, it's an instance where it's not maybe, it's not only uh, economically infeasible, but it is not providing the services that we need, which I think is just as critical as the financial end of it. So uh, anytime that something's mandated by a union or this or that, and it's not working out, you have to look at other options. Very good. Get 10 seconds to go. Um, <laughs> the, um, the reason we're concerned about it is that basically right now, uh, we pave 100 miles of, let's say, I-75. And if we didn't have this prevailing wage, we could actually pave 132 miles. And, and that's the overall consensus. Elmer says they pay their guys like 20 to 25 bucks an hour, but when they bid these jobs, they gotta pay them 35, 40, 50 dollars an hour. And that's on our backs. So that's why I wanted your opinions on it. Um, off of uh, uh, financial uh, situation, I wanna talk just quickly about um, a social issue that has made the papers uh, recently. Um, Lee Chatfield is primary challenging Frank Foster up in the 107th, which serves Emmett, Sheboygan, Mackinac, and Chippewa counties up in the UP. Governor Snyder mentioned this on Mackinac Island, uh, forced Terry Lynn Land to have to give a response to it, and that's the repeal of the Elliott Larson Act. Now, you guys might be, if elected, having to deal with this next year. If Frank wins his primary, rumors are is he's going to introduce the bill with Democrats uh, to show bipartisanship and to get the bill introduced and would be voted on the lame duck. But if he loses, it may be pushed off till next year. So that's why I wanted to get you on the record and get your opinion on this. Elliot Larson, what he's trying to do is repeal it so they will give protected class status to bisexuals, gays, lesbians and transgender to get protected class status so that they could ensue employers and real estate owners if they were discriminated against. For example, if Nancy hired uh, me to be her bodyguard for the building. I interview, I'm six foot four, 320 pounds. I have a CPL, um, she hires me. Monday after I get hired, I come in and I'm dressed up in a dress with makeup, a wig, and pearls. She would not be able to fire me because of this new provision they're working on because she could be sued by my attorney, 1-800-CALL-SAM, to basically sue her for firing me for discrimination because obviously I'm a cross-dresser. If you're elected, would you support that repeal and give this protected class status to the LGBT community, or would you be against it? We'll start with you, Karen. I'm definitely against it. I mean, I just, uh, you know, how about protecting the business owner for a change? 
and a little common sense will go a long way. I've had businesses for 40 years and uh, it's a struggle every single day. Something like that on top of it is just uh, abhorrent to me. Uh, I'm a conservative, I'm a Christian, I'd like to stand on those principles and I don't need the government dictating something else which puts another stranglehold on me as a business person. Uh, it's tough enough as it is and I find that abhorrent. So that's how I stand. Very good. Rob? Uh, well, I'll, let me say this first off. I've gotten tons of letters from special interest groups in Lansing concerned about their legislation. And they all ask me, when my bill comes up, how are you going to vote? And my answer to them all is the same. I will read every bill, I will give it uh, its consideration when it's before me because there might be things in that bill that are in addition to what you're asking me right now that uh, I might or not be, uh, may or may not be interested in. So uh, that said, uh, I'm not going to comment on any particular bill until it's before me. I read it, I consider its, uh, its own advantages and disadvantages for the society and our economy. Having said that, um, I am totally against putting more regulations on small business. We've got enough. I, you know, I deal with inspectors at our family business, and amazing how when you get close to election, they all seem to show up and find something wrong that's been that way for 10 years or more. But um, uh, certainly, uh, we also have some rental properties. Uh, there, there are no cases where people are being discriminated against that I've seen. Um, you know, we're, we're a great community. We're, we, we care for people. As long as they're going to take good care of the house they're renting, we don't need more laws on real estate and, or more laws on businesses. Okay, and Matt? Yeah, I'm going to have a, a similar answer to that, actually, unfortunately. But, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's a good point, is that I, I really can't comment on this law or this, this bill because I just don't know enough about it. I haven't read the text, um, so I can't say that. Um, I certainly don't like uh, discrimination against um, anyone, um, and I think it's a really stupid business practice, to be quite honest with you, um, to, to discriminate against anyone. I think capitalism, the, the only two colors they see is green and gold, so, uh, uh, and, and, and that's, that's all they care about. So having said that, um, I also am very opposed to more regulations on businesses. But as far as this particular law goes, I'd, I'd really have to read it and, and get into it before I could make a comment. The uh, follow-up to that, just so I'm clear, you're you're basically off taking the uh, the government not putting more regulations on businesses. Um, right now, we have discrimination laws. If anybody feels they're being discriminated against, they can sue. But this would give specific protected class status specifically to them for those real estate opportunities uh, with owners. Uh, you didn't sell us the house because we were two gay guys. And so therefore we're gonna sue you. You know, that kind of thing. So just wanted to be clear, you're also maybe perhaps against it uh, because you don't feel that we need this extra protected class status. You think we already have discrimination laws on the books? Just just want to make sure we clarify real quick. Yeah, uh, well, very specifically, I think what you're looking to hear is um, uh, being, uh, I guess someone's sexual behavior to me doesn't create a class. It creates uh, a behavior. If someone's skin color is black, red, blue, whatever, okay, that's, that's, that's what they're born with as their skin color. How they behave, the things they choose to do, uh, you know, that isn't a protectable class to me, okay? Um, you know, yeah, we're born with uh, certain propensities. Some people are, are more likely to drink than other people, or, you know, yeah, we all have things we're born with that we tend towards a behavior, but that, that to me doesn't create a class. Uh, I agree with Rob on that. Uh, what I want to say, though, is uh, I'm against further regulations on the business person. We have way too many as it is. Uh, I'd like to simplify things if I get to Lansing for the business person. Uh, I have felt that boot on my neck for 40 years, that boot of regulation and tax on the other side. And so uh, you will have a friend, the business person will have a friend in Karen Rennie if I go to Lansing, believe me. Did you want to make further comment, Matt? Yes. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Yeah, so again, just to clarify, uh, whether or not I, I uh, believe in making a protected class for this, it's really, it's really a tough call because, quite frankly, I don't really appreciate some of the things I see in the media towards gay people. And again, I think it's anti-capitalist. It's like if somebody wants to buy a house, you sell them a house. So all I'm going to say is that it's a, it's to me, any anyone that would discriminate against this is not a good business person. So whether or not this is this is something that needs to be done, I don't know, but that's my opinion. Okay, next subject. Uh, one of the things that has been discussed and bantered around uh, was ever since Granholm and her infamous Michigan business tax and single business tax, um, there's been talk about tax reform. Under Governor Snyder, um, they eliminated the Michigan business tax and the surcharge, but they did it on uh, some of the seniors having to start paying taxes on their pension plans. And some people say it was kind of a tax shift as opposed to, you know, just eliminating it. Um, one of the proposals that are out there for restructuring um, that uh, Greg McMaster actually has the blue back on it already and is going to be ready to drop uh, if he goes into the Senate is for the Michigan Fair Tax. And what that does, it eliminates state income tax, it eliminates all business taxes, it eliminates the personal property tax, which is on our ballot uh, August 5th, Proposal 1. It eliminates it entirely. It locks in local revenue sharing, um, but basically in changing our sales tax from 6%, it would go probably right now they're estimating between nine and nine and a half. Is that something you would favor if you get elected and go to Lansing? Would you be willing to support that in the House if Greg drops it in the Senate? And number two, if not, what would be your plan for reforming uh, state income tax here in Michigan? We'll start with Rob first. Okay. Uh, this again is one of the questionnaires, one of the questions on one of the questionnaires from the groups I've gotten, and, um, and my answer is the same. I need to see it laid out in writing. I need to see exactly what the bill is going to do. Whenever we make a change in our taxes in Lansing, it seems like there's all these little tales, just like um, the proposal one you might bring up later. Uh, there's there's just a whole bunch of little hidden. Um, you know, back doors in it where Lansing can, you know, try and get more money out of us. So I'm very, very skeptical when changing taxes. However, let me say that um, as, as a human being and, and knowing a little bit about human nature, those things which you reward, you get more of. Those things which you penalize, you get less of. When our taxes are on businesses for making a profit or owning equipment, you're going to get less of that. You're going to get you're gonna to get to the point, like right now, if my business has more than $50,000 in profit every year, it's going to pay a much higher tax rate. So once we work hard enough to re to achieve that $50,000, we just, you know, well, let's get the iced tea out and relax a little bit because we're just gonna to have to pay a whole bunch more taxes if we work harder. Uh, and so instead of growing our businesses, we're, you know, in, in building the economy and you know, hiring more employees in Northern Michigan and creating better jobs, uh, we're taxed to a point where it's just not worth it to us anymore, and we're disincentivized from doing that. So that's how I view taxation. Am I out of time? Yeah. Well, I, I ran it over, and I'll let Karen in. Okay. Karen okay. Minute 30. Okay. Very good. Uh, let's go to uh, Matt. Minute 30 on the tax question. How Would you be willing to support the fair tax, or would you have another plan? Yeah, actually, I'm very, very supportive of the fair tax. Um, I think it's a very good idea, um, and I'm certainly, um, and the fair tax is, if I'm correct in this, uh, eliminating the income tax, income and then and then going business tax and business tax. exactly. And I think that that's it's a great idea, partially because it encourages saving, and uh, I'm I'm very big on that. I think you know, I mean, we spend so much money, not just at the government level, but on a personal level. And part of the reason is because we do have this income tax. Um, and it, it doesn't allow us to save as much money as we could uh, from what we get. Um, and that's, that to me is something that's very important. And I think that's really the biggest reason why I support the fair tax, is because I think it will encourage saving um, and, and it will help, it'll help the economy that way. Um, there's many other reasons, but um, uh, tax, tax questions I get it's they're very confusing, but that's that's my general consensus on the fair taxes. Yes, I can support it. Very good. Uh, 
I'm very supportive of that idea. I had an interview, as we all did, uh, it was last week at, for the Chamber of Commerce, and at that time, uh, I said I, I did applaud uh, our, our elected officials for putting into place the um, right to uh, work option for our state. But that's only the first part. We need to, I said I wanted to repeal the state income tax. I've been saying that for a long time. Uh, we're not competitive. I look at the states like Texas and well, we don't have to go that far. We can look at it in Indiana, and we can see what they're doing there. Uh, I turn on the television occasionally. I, very, I really can't stomach most of it, but when I do, I'm seeing commercials for New York State. Uh, they're giving a 10-year uh, tax deferment, and uh, t businesses are going there. So, I mean, there's proof right there. The thing of it is, and my husband and I discuss taxes all the time, because he's on, as everybody knows, he's on the county commission, and they discuss budget issues all the time. Um, what are you going to replace things with? You know, things that, right now it's like a shell game. They take from this, but they put from that, and you don't know where it's going. So the fair tax would be the way to go to handle this. And I, I'm in complete agreement with this. I called him Senator McMaster already, but uh, Representative McMaster on this issue. This would give, and as a user tax, if you don't want to go buy that washing machine, you don't have the funds, you don't do it. So that, yes, sir, I'm, I'm in favor of the fair tax. And I, uh, I apologize for these other candidates not being here today because I was really looking forward to their answers on that one, especially uh, Larry Inman and others. The reason that uh, it's a big to do is because if businesses had no taxes in this state, like you mentioned, Indiana, Florida, Texas, we would bring businesses here and they'd bring those jobs and we'd fill up our schools, our churches. I mean, we'd have funding for things. Uh, research said that right now we're at 10 million and potentially if this was passed, we would grow Michigan's population to 20 million. We could actually double, so keep that in mind. One of the things um, that comes up is our roads, obviously, we have a problem. And you guys have heard all the different types of options and proposals people are suggesting out there. Um, but one of the things that uh, has been talked about, and we had a whole, actually a three-hour show on this, was finding a billion dollars in our current $53 billion budget as opposed to raising any taxes whether it's fuel taxes, uh, license plate fees, and things like that. Give you just a minute, because I think we're all pretty much in consensus on it, but what do you think about uh, the road situation and how would you like to handle uh, that issue? Fixing the roads and whether you want to raise taxes or try to find it in the budget, that kind of answer is what we're looking for. The roads are uh, just abysmal. Uh, the roads are our arteries for business, commerce, tourism, farmers, moving uh, goods back and forth. Uh, I'm on the roads every day. They're in horrible condition. Uh, our economy is suffering, however. We don't, we don't have any money. We're broke. We don't have any more money for additional taxes. I think people would be stunned, many of them, if they actually knew how the, tax, the gas tax was divided. Uh, I am not in favor of raising more taxes to raise revenue for these roads. That would be my last option, and I'm dead last. Uh, Lansing needs to cut the fat. I'm a fiscal conservative, I know how to do it, and uh, they have a lot of frivolous programs, and I would not raise taxes. I would find it within the budget in Lansing, and it's there. Matt, what's the that? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so we, we pretty much are in agreement on this. There's money there. Um, my, my take on it is that there's, there's probably a lot of crony capitalism going on and we need to cut corporate welfare. Um, you know, it's, if you give 20 billion to a company, it's the same as giving 20 bucks to a bomb. They're both gonna probably piss it away. And uh, it's, it's really, it's really, you know, it's really just time we get it, we get it out of there. And so there's definitely money there and we definitely need to find it. We don't need to raise taxes. That's, that's a ridiculous idea. So uh, that's, that's my take. Thank you. I've given a lot of money to bombs, but it was my own money, not yours. <laughs> um, 
bum. And I don't call them bums, they're just right. human beings to me. Yeah. I know. We know, we know yeah. <laughs> um, what were we talking about? Roads. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Um, no new taxes. Uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, you know what's our what's our state budget at? Close to 50 billion now. Like 30 percent higher than just 10 years ago. I, I think we got enough money. It, it's not it's not an issue of not enough money. The money is there. It's giving it's being taken out of yours in my pocket. It's in Lansing. Let's figure out where it's going because it didn't go to the roads like it should have. Okay. The reason I brought that up too was um, there was an off air, off, well, I should say open mic comment made um, by your former state representative, the seat that you guys are running for, where uh, Bridge Magazine caught him saying, well, we can just pass it now and then raise it in Lane Duck later. You're all familiar with that. Um, he's also, and, and the re I'm, this is not an attack against him personally, but what I was doing with this question, because we had this sent in to us actually to our radio show to ask you guys, um, in comparing yourself to the former state representative that has served this district for six years, would you consider your voting record against his voting record, would you see that a lot of the votes he, he took or bills that he did, you guys were supportive of? Or do you see yourself being perhaps more uh, conservative than him? Uh, because this was an issue that they came up with uh, scorecards. You're all familiar with, you guys are now being scored on all your votes. So just uh, take one minute and, and tell the, uh, the folks listening um, if you feel that you would be perhaps more conservative than the former state rep, or do you feel he's you know, done a fair job on his voting record? We'll start with you, Rep. Running a small business, I get to deal with a lot of the stuff that comes out of Lansing. And I'll give you a couple examples of things my state, state representative passed in Lansing. Um, let's see, the first one was a couple years back, uh, we, we sell beverages. And if you get a keg of beer, now you have to, the store has to have a logbook of who got the keg of beer. Okay, added more regulation. However, if you buy two, uh, two 30 packs of beer cans, it's the same amount of beer, but you don't have to register it. You could give it to minors at a campus frat party just as easily. Um, you know, that's just one example. Another one is a couple days ago, um, actually it's about two weeks ago, a state inspector shows up for the bedding plants we sell at our store. Uh, you know, the petunias and the, all that stuff, uh, marigolds, what have you. Uh, and the inspector shows up and now she wants to see not just my license to sell, which I paid $100 to get, uh, but they also want to see every invoice where I purchased plants and the license, the copy of the license of everyone I purchased it from. So I, I drop what I'm doing, stop running my business, stop taking care of my customers, and I go do what this inspector wants at the drop of a hat. And she says, oh, by the way, there's a new law. I get to charge you $57 an hour to come here and inspect you, even if you have everything 100% above the board correct. Okay, um, so I guess from a business perspective, I consider myself more conservative than our current representative. Uh, you know, these are things I've, I've mentioned to him and, you know, I didn't really have a comment on him, but, you know, I checked the record and, yeah, they voted for him. And, you know, all of our Northern Michigan representatives have voted for this stuff. And there's just a lot of these little things that the small business owner, the medium-sized business owner, we get to deal with. Okay, and when I'm not taking care of my customers, I'm not running my business, I'm not growing the economy. That's, that's what we really need to take a look at in Lansing. Okay, Karen. I was sitting at my desk the other day and besides running my campaign, I have my own small business. The name of my business is Blue River Properties Incorporated. I have a stack of paperwork like this. And I said to my husband, you know, we incorporated in 1975. Ask me today if I would do the same thing again. I can tell you it would be no. Because back then I was more optimistic. They have made it so much more complicated. Paperwork, this regulation, that regulation. And I've been at this a long time and it's horrible. And if you don't comply, you're going to pay, and uh, it's just uh, incredible. It just is so burdensome, and uh, it doesn't have to be this way. But you know what I've said to, to people before? We let this happen. It was you and I. 
And you need to have some strong leadership in Lansing to stop this and put an end to it. If you elect me, I'm, I'm going to do my best. I'll tell you what, I'm not that big of a person, but I'm going to stand strong against this. Do you feel your voting record will be Listen, more considered? Listen, I've been really disappointed in our sitting representative. Uh, there's many people that call themselves Republicans. Uh, we, we, I see that on the board that my husband serves on. They're all Republicans. Broad spectrum under that R. So um, I, I would be very much more conservative than Representative Schmidt. Good. Matt, jump in on that hotbed. Sure. Uh, so, you know, with all the, uh, all the bills that go through, I can't say that the majority of them I disagree with Wayne on. Uh, there's a lot of frivolous revolu resolutions that I guess I don't care enough to uh, um, disagree with him on. But in terms of what he's done and how he's been a representative, I think I'd be very, very different. Um, I don't see him pushing um, for a lot of a lot of things that he believes in. Um, I don't see him standing up for this community as much as I'd like to see him stand up for this community. Um, I think that he compromises a lot, um, and I don't know that uh, I don't know that I agree with him on on that kind of issue. But uh, as far as my voting record would go, I'm not sure how different it would be but my personality would certainly be different and the type of bills I would put out would be much more conservative than the kinds that he's put out. Okay, I'd like to just uh, take any questions that you folks might have at this point. I'm pretty well versed in all the different topics from being on the radio. Uh, Anita uh, or Carol, was it uh, Jason? You mentioned just say they could put them up on the table up over here or I could pick them up if, if you'd like. Or you can just shout them out and I'll you know, pass the question on. If anybody has any questions, just raise your hand as we go forward. If not, okay. Uh, no, I have a question. Go ahead, sir. My name is Joe Welsh, and I'm a small business owner. I've uh, been in the restaurant business many years, and I've noticed some things that have gone on in, uh, um, in the country nationally, uh, certainly locally, uh, where over the last 30 to 40 years, we have seen a pronounced uptick in the rates of chronic disease in the United States. Uh, and uh, I've spent a lot of time researching this problem. I've, seen, I've spent a lot of time uh, uh, looking at food processing, where food comes from, how it's raised, and I see a lot of pro I see there's a major 800 pound gorilla in the room, uh, and you have a lot of people who are talking about health care. It's a big issue in the country. There's a a lot of problems with that. My father retired when they started Obamacare. He was a physician for 33 years in, in Marquette um, because of the way the health care is going. And I'm noticing that there's an 800-pound gorilla in the room that nobody will mention, nobody will talk about it. I sent a question over to Jamie Callahan, who he dodged it completely. All right, And it's called genetic engineering. All right, And, and, and when you look at what is going on in genetic sharecropping and the way that some of these big ag companies have taken over farming on a mass scale, okay? And you look at the correlating uh, increase in chronic disease, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, you name it. Uh, across the board, you've got escalating rates of disease and it's t I'm telling you, it doesn't take a, a genius to see how these things have crept into the food stream and you've got a direct cor correlation between genetic engineering and chronic disease increase in this country. Now my question is, is who amongst you is going to have the strength and the fortitude to go and, and, to, and to tackle an issue like this in Lansing? Because now there's a, there's a country across the other side of the world, there's a communist country called China, okay? And they recently banned all imports of U.S. corn because it's all genetically sharecropped, okay? Now, if a communist country won't feed that to its slaves, why are we stuck with it here in the United States of America? Why are we stuck with it here in Michigan? Why are we stuck with all kinds of family farms in the state of Michigan put out of business by companies like Monsanto? And what are you gonna do about it? Okay, and just to be clear, these people are running for the state house seat here in the 104th. 
Some of that might be applicable to federal regulations, but you're right, the states do have their own so sovereignty, their own rights to be able to fight stuff like that. So who would like to answer that one first? Matt? Hi, uh, yeah, this is actually one of my, uh, one of my uh, pet peeves as far as big ag goes. Um, I'm a huge proponent of small farms and getting things local, and I think one of the biggest problems um, that that small farms face is that there's all these regulations that basically favor the big agricultural producers and and all these little food laws and regulations you know some people like like to come out and say oh these are to help the people bs they're they're to help the big agriculture and they're help to help the the crony capitalist state um so for me, that's that's what I'd say. I want to get I want to get the regulations out of there that do allow for small farms to to benefit and to grow. Um, because right now, I think the market's cornered on on by by big agriculture. Now, what can I do at the state house on that level? I don't know. But um, some of the things that I've come out for are are certainly in, decreased regulations on farmers very specifically, especially small farmers. Um, you know, allowing, uh, allowing chickens in your backyard, that's great for me. Um, these are just little things, obviously. Raw milk, I love. Um, that I, I, me too. <laughs> yeah, I, I lived in, well, and here's the other thing I want to just mention, and sorry if I'm going too big on this. I lived in Vietnam for, for four years. I had a friend over there who wanted to open a restaurant. He was a chef over here. He'd gone over to write a book. It, from the time he decided to open the restaurant, he had to renovate like a whole new, a whole building into a, into a restaurant. From the time that he start, got that idea to the time that it opened was two months. Two months. And, and, and that is, a, Vietnam is a communist country. And the fact that, that we can't do that here is insane to me. It's absolutely crazy. So that's, that's my answer to that question. Well, I'm a registered nurse, and uh, I actually left hospital nursing because of some of these issues. My husband's fully aware of this. Um, and I've told him for many years, it'll be amazing. I won't be here to see what we find in medicine. They'll, they'll look back upon us, and they'll go, those fools, it was right in front of them, and it was in their water, and it was in their diet. I, I left hospital nursing because of the, pharma, the impact of the pharmaceutical industry, quite frankly. Uh, I remember as a licensed person, I, when you dispense a medication, you're responsible. You're responsible if the patient has a bad reaction. I would, if I couldn't say with certainty what the reaction was gonna be, I would look it up in the PDR, that's the physician's desk reference, and if I wasn't satisfied there, I would uh, call the pharmacist and I would say, what's the combination of this cocktail? And he would, he or she would say, well, we fed it into the computer and there's no, we don't know. Well, you know, that wasn't good enough for me. And so my husband and I, if you know how we live, we're like a bioidenticals and this and that, we, but it, Joe, to address your question, um, I have some friends that are organic farmers what we put those people through to produce a clean product yeah. to take to market is mind-boggling. And they're frustrated, they, they have to charge a lot more for their product because of all the regulations and whatnot they have to go through. I'd like to help them. I'd like to help the organic farmer. I'm a member of Oriana and uh, I have to pay to do that. It's, you pay for the products. Joe is a wonderful uh, entrepreneur in downtown Traverse City, and I enjoy his products because not only are they delicious, but uh, he owns the Cherry Cone, I'll give him a plug. Um, they're pure products, and we enjoy them very, very much. So thank you very much. Okay, I don't know if I'll need two minutes to say it, but I think uh, what we can do at the state level has already been demonstrated you've ever seen a substance that is known to the state of California to cause XYZ and a horn to grow on your head. Um, that's, uh, that's what we can do, it, it, at least at the outset, is something we can insist on products being labeled as to, right. you know, if, if this is Monsanto's the plague virus used to modify 
corn. Um, then, you know, maybe it should say modified with plague virus to, <laughs> to produce corn. So that's, that's where I would start. You know, as far as having the fortitude to do something right, um, I don't think anyone up here to have a problem with that. Um, I know if, if I know it and I can scientifically show it, um, I have no problem getting behind it. I was actually, that question was on my list, um, primarily triggered because uh, we've uh, interviewed and met with, been down to his farm, Mark Baker, the pig farmer. Baker's Acres. Yeah, Baker's Green Acres. Yeah. And uh, I was at his farm just uh, last weekend with um, the constitutional sheriff, Sheriff Mack. And uh, a lady who is, um, I forget the name of the company, I believe she's out of Ann Arbor, she drove her dairy truck there where she was basically hijacked at gunpoint by the Michigan uh, D, the MDA for Michigan. Told that she had to dump 1,200 gallons of raw milk. They had to break um, 1,200 eggs or 12,000 eggs individually on the ground. And they had to be witness right there. And I mean, this, this was one of our questions exactly as to what's going on in the state of Michigan is just completely insane. The Michigan Pork Producers Association is behind uh, Governor Snyder and Bill Schuette's prosecution through their DNR to harass, in my opinion, Mark Baker over his pigs, which I went down there and saw his operation and it's completely ridiculous what they're claiming that's going to happen. But anyway, that was one of the questions. So obviously you know that this is a concern and if you get elected, you need to do something about it. Um, in that vein too, one of the other uh, questions that came up was that I was gonna ask, especially Isaiah, was because he was endorsed by Farm Bureau of Michigan, was um, does he support these GMO type of seed processes that are going on by Monsanto and all these other companies. So unfortunately, though, he's not here because I was really interested in hearing his response on that. <clears throat> One of the other areas that, um, and maybe some of you guys um, have submitted questions here, I'll take them now and, and put them out there. One of the things that we're talking about, it seems like almost every week on the radio, is the state of Michigan has set up under John Engler uh, and by the way, Rick Snyder was the chairman, the very first chairman of this, is the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. And that's something that they set up back under Angler, where the state of Michigan takes our tax dollars and provides grants, loans, depending on whatever, to private industry to try to get them to bring jobs or create jobs or whatever here in Michigan. One of the questions from the audience is, What's your impression of the MEDC um, giving away millions of dollars under the guise of job creation? Would you want to keep it, change it, or eliminate it? And we'll start with Karen, MEDC. Well, we need economic development, but we need to do it carefully. Uh, since my husband's been a commissioner, you know, I've observed everything he, he goes through, and I, I study his issues as well. Every single thing that it seems like always they ask for a grant for this, for that, um, always has strings attached. I've noticed that. And uh, it's, it's almost incredible that nobody does anything without that process now. Um, so we need economic development. Sure enough, but um, we have to be really, really careful how we, we do that. And it's always dangerous when somebody is in a position where they can pick the winners and the losers. And that concerns me. Um, so um, I don't know if that really answered your question, but would you I, keep it, change it, or eliminate it? I'd probably change it. I don't know if it needs elimination, but we can't keep it as it is. It's, uh, it, the model is not correct the way it is right now. Okay, one minute, yeah. Uh, yeah, there, I mean, this is one of the, the big things in my, that I've been bringing up is uh, corporate welfare. I mean, that's, that's really what this is. Um, you know, and, and I have a bigger problem with corporate welfare than I do with regular welfare. Uh, you know, it's like we're rewarding, 
we're rewarding a, a company for being horrible. What kind of capitalist are we? Um, so I don't, I'd, I'd love to see it eliminated or at least its name changed to something that's more appropriate for its, uh, uh, you know, for what it does. Because uh, I think it's really misleading. Um, you know, it's cute when they call it the Michigan Economic Development Corporation when they should be calling it the Michigan Give Money to Failing Companies Corporation. But um, so, but but yeah, I, I'd love to see it eliminated or at least changed so much that it would not resemble what it is today. So that's that's my answer. Good. One minute round. Oh boy. Um... I'd love to see one less government program. Uh, government never seems to shrink. They always come up with a new way to make government take care of everybody, and it always costs me more money. It never achieves what they say it's going to, just like this the, recently, the, the raising of uh, hunting and fishing licenses, basically doubling the cost uh, for most hunters and, hunter, uh, hunters and fishermen. Uh, so with MEDC, um, I haven't seen any good coming of it. I, I've seen a lot of failures. I've seen a lot of misinformation. Uh, so uh, from where I sit right now with the information I have right now, I'm in favor of just eliminating the program. All right. One of these questions, uh, actually the uh, 37th State Senate District Democrat candidate, Jimmy Schmidt, is very high on this next question that came from the audience. He'd like to see high-speed rail from Detroit and Grand Rapids go to Midland or Mount Pleasant there at Central Michigan. And then there's a rail uh, spur that's already out there that could come, one lake could come here to Traverse City and another one could go to Petoskey. Do you think that Michigan, uh, because of our roads, the cost of fuel, green energy, greenhouse gases, and all that whole component, if you got elected to go to Lansing, would you be willing to vote to support his plan to bring high-speed rail here to northern Michigan, giving us ability to go back and forth to the center of the state, and then over to Grand Rapids, or over to, you know, Macomb, Oakland, Wayne County area? So uh, let's start off first with Rob. Well, I do believe that public infrastructure is a role of government. We need good roads, and we, we also need to do that in a cost-effective manner. So uh, if someone wants to bring high-speed rail to here, to the UP, wherever, I'm okay with it. But let's, see your, let's see your numbers. Where's the business plan? Is this going to be cost-effective for the tax dollars spent? Because it's not going to be cheap. It's going to cost a lot of money. What's the payoff? How many years of how many people using this will it take before it pays for itself? What are the, da the dangers involved? And they need to be realistic numbers. Um, yeah, MEDC has proven, land, you know, government is great at giving you numbers, whatever you want to hear. Uh, you know, we had that issue with questionable figures just last year. Uh, so, yeah, I guess that's, that's my answer. Of, you know, I want to see the bill, I want to see the numbers. Yeah, I, uh, well, I love train travel. I think it's wonderful. Um, I mean, this country was, was really built on, uh, on railroad, uh, railroad production. Um, on that note, I'd love to see it, but I'd love to see it be private. Um, and I think of, I, I don't know all the numbers on this, but any time that the government seems to have a um, monopoly, if you will, on, on a certain industry, like Amtrak does with, uh, you know, uh, commuter rail service, uh, my guess is that there's a bunch of regulations in place that are making it, you know, unnecessary or at least unattractive for uh, for private industry to enter the market. And uh, I certainly don't think that a government train is going to to help us uh, in the long run. Um, but I'd love to see a private one. I really would. I think it'd be great. So that's my answer. Okay. Karen, one minute. Uh, I would love to have high-speed rail. I agree with Matt. I think it would be uh, better served by the private sector. And uh, I agree with Rob. It's a matter of dollars and cents. But would I like to see it? Oh, heck yes. Especially when I get elected and go to Lansing. Hop on that train and get off in Lansing. And uh, I'd be all in favor of it. Uh, so, yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, just so you know, he um, uses 
uh, Jimmy Schmidt does, the Democrat candidate, uses the um, rail system in New Mexico that runs from Albuquerque to Santa Fe. It's two levels high, it has Wi-Fi, there's uh, advertising that's sold on the train, and it is a public-private enterprise that they did both public and private. So, something to think about, just want to know what your thoughts were on that one. They're, they're, they not only are paying for itself in New Mexico, but it's making a profit. Um, the Wi-Fi provider sells uh, cards where you can have unlimited access to the Wi-Fi. And a lot of the business people uh, actually bring their laptops. And that hour and a half or two hour ride, they get a lot of work done. So they pay for the Wi-Fi and the advertisers. They found that the advertisers had a huge increase in their businesses because they were supporting the train. So a lot of people would frequent those businesses and it is profitable. So something to think about. Because as conservatives, we're not always thinking uh, Agenda 21 and we don't want to talk about high-speed rail, get rid of our cars, our independence. But if it's a private way to do it or a private public way to do it and it's profitable, like Rob said, that was a great point. Show me the numbers. And I think you all agree with that. So. Okay, last um, question from the audience, and if you have any others, uh, there's cards there, just fill them out real quick, because uh, we're gonna go for, I don't know, about another half hour or so, or 20 minutes, and just get this on video, so we can show these candidates participated in a fair and open and balanced debate, and these other people that didn't attend really wasn't necessary for them to chicken out. I'll just say it that way. The uh, bridge to Canada. I actually testified in front of Senator Colwell's committee on this at the Boji building back when it was killed in the House and killed in the Senate. Governor Snyder went around our legislators and entered into an interlocal agreement with Canada, a little trick that Richard McClellan, an attorney, you guys, if you get elected, you'll learn his name when you get to Lansing, gave him the plan on how to enter into this interlocal agreement and go around our state legislators to get his quote unquote Drick Bridge, the Detroit crossing down between Detroit and Windsor. The question is, what is your position on um, the bridge? Um, and how do you feel if you get elected, if Governor Snyder gets elected, you'd be serving, you know, with him having four more years. Um, how do you feel about him going around the legislators and doing that government bridge? And how do you feel about maybe going ahead and having to deal and work with him for the next two years for sure if you get elected? We'll start with Karen first. None of you knew my dad, except Charlie. He was a real tough character. I married one. Um, I would be working with the governor, I would not be working for the governor or under the governor. I would stand strong, I'm a principled person. I would study issues, if I disagreed with the governor, I would stand on my principle and with my opinion. And I would back it up with facts. Uh, I don't appreciate somebody that takes a back, a back row to get something done. Uh, Something reminds me of uh, our president right now. And uh, I, I think we've had enough of that. I'm, I'm pretty fed up with that. So uh, just to tell you once again, I'm, if Governor Snyder is reelected, and if I'm fortunate enough to get the voters to vote for me, I would work with him, but not for him and not under him. Thank you. One minute, Rob. Um, Questions about the bridge, right? Yeah. Okay, so. How do you feel about Governor Snyder and also your position on the bridge? Okay, well, the first time I heard about this bridge, and I'll talk fast because I only got one minute, was I was sitting at the Rotary Club and someone came in and uh, was telling the whole Rotary Club how good this bridge was and how we needed it. That was the first time I ever heard about this bridge. Well, it really got me wondering why would someone from Canada come to the United States, up to Michigan, northern Michigan, Traverse City, to the Rotary Club, and tell us about this wonderful bridge and why we need it? Um, and so I started running the numbers he was giving us, and he was telling us how it would cash flow, it would pay for itself. And they didn't add up. I got out a calculator, and a simple arithmetic, I could have used an abacus, it was so simple. It just, it, the math doesn't make sense. Um, it was going to cost taxpayers a lot of money. So uh, from the get-go, I've been very skeptical of the bridge and uh, rather critical of, uh, of its uh, construction. And I agreed with the legislature when they were uh, putting the stops to it. 
Um, so uh, I don't. How do you feel about that? Uh, Governor Schneider going around the legislature, I think he bypassed the, the will of the people by doing that. That's why we live in a republic. That's why we vote for people to represent us. Uh, so I, I, I feel it was a, a kind of a dirty political move. Uh, I don't agree with it. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I guess the first thing I'll address is Schneider. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything he's done, um, but he's so much better than Grand Holm that it's like, it's hard for me to be really mad at him. Um, and I mean, things are just so much better when, than from when I left to when I come back. It's, it really is just so great. But uh, anyway, on that note, uh, no, what he did was, was pretty shady. And, and again, it's, uh, there's many things that he's done that I would not have done myself, but you know, it is what it is. My, uh, but what I've heard on the bridge, I have not run the numbers like Rob has, and I would have to if I was going to make a comment on it. But um, I do know also that a lot of the lobbying that was being done against it was being done by the guy that owns the bridge that is currently there, the Ambassador Bridge. And to me, when that happens, I kind of go, uh, uh. So um, I don't really know what's going on with this. Both sides have their their issues. I don't know that I really have a side right now without looking into it more. Um, it was. It is. It hasn't been an important issue to me, at least not like in terms of. It's just not an issue I put a great deal into. So that's my comment. Thank you. In having spoken to a lot of the uh, state reps and state senators that were against the bridge, they did take campaign contributions from Manny Maroon in the Ambassador Bridge Company. Um, but they also believed in taking that money that it was a private company providing a private service and that he pays a lot of fees to maintain that bridge according to their regulations, both federal and state. And um, he's profitable. And because he's profitable, he was able to donate to your state representative now and your state senator now and quite a few of the other ones um, to be against the bridge because he was trying to protect his investment. And then, God bless him, I guess. This was a question from the audience that I was going to ask you guys, but it's got a couple of layers to it. So I will ask you all to indulge me a little bit because we've been talking about this and actually I broke some news on our radio station Friday about this. There is an internal struggle within the Michigan Republican Party. Some of the leaders within the party itself are being influenced by really about one or two people. I broke on a radio station on Friday that Betsy DeVos has a gay son and it has not been disclosed publicly. I got this through four different sources that heard it directly. She has been influencing this particular race across the state of Michigan in Michigan Republican Party politics because of a group called the Great Lakes Education Project or GLEP. They've been attacking any candidate that is for traditional family, traditional marriage defined as between one man and one woman because they are supporting and trying to get Michigan to become gay marriage state as well as having the Michigan Republican Party adopt its platform for us to be acknowledging gay marriage. In addition, these same candidates are against Common Core and there was a story breaking that there is some books that have been tested in New York for ninth graders to learn as part of their curriculum. Common Core had been limited to math and reading, and now they're rolling out their science core curriculum standards. As part of the ninth grade health class, they're gonna teach uh, homosexuality, bisexuality, and bestiality as being a optional choice of sex. My question is this, do you feel this is an issue that should be discussed in the Michigan Republican Party? Do you feel that this is an issue that could divide the Michigan Republican Party? And do you feel that perhaps it's right for wealthy individuals to be driving this type of agenda, putting pressure on candidates by running negative advertising? That was basically what the question is. But I want you to all to have the background and then allow you to, to answer the question however you're comfortable with. 
I'm a talk show radio host and I can talk about these things, you're running for elected office. So, with that, Matt, I'll let you go first. Yeah, so I actually need a little bit of clarification on this. Um, so, is the question about the Great Lakes Education Project or is it about Betsy DeVos? I'm not really sure what... The negative advertising that group's putting out against mm -hmm. candidates do you support or do you disagree with negative campaigning? Well, I mean, I think, you know, this party's divided enough, and I think this race is a great example of what, of what we should be doing. And that is, there's been no negative ads from any of us against anyone else. Um, even though, as today proves, we have a very wide array of political beliefs. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the infighting with the party needs to stop. Um, I'm really tired of it. Uh, on these other issues that are coming up, um, you know, I have many, many different views, but on the issue of very specifically, should there be negative campaign ads, Republicans versus Republicans, you guys, we're so divided right now, it, it's, it's horrible. So yeah, yeah, that needs to stop. Okay, uh, this, there's a lot of issues dividing the Republican Party, and I, you know, you can you can choose the, the gay marriage issue, but there's actually a lot of other core issues. Um, and what I personally believe it comes down to is just being a nice human being and saying it's okay we can disagree, but we're one party, we're the Republican Party. Uh, I've, I've been actually disgusted by the divisions that have happened. Um, really starting at the Tea Party movement that gave the Republican Party control of the state of Michigan in the House and the Senate um, and, the governor. and, and the governorship. Um, it, it seems like, uh, you know, hey, we, you gave us the ball, now we're going to keep it. it. It was the attitude of some of the, the mainstream Republicans. Um, and I, I disagree with that completely. You know, I don't claim to be a strictly Tea Party person, and I don't claim to be a mainstream Republican. I'm just a small business owner that wants to uh, give a, a local voice at Lansing. Um, so I, I think the division goes a lot deeper than just one issue, and I think we need to remember what we learned in kindergarten about sharing and being friendly and nice and not calling names. Well, uh, for those of you who don't know, I did not received the endorsement from Flip. Uh, I believe I, most of you know why I did not get the endorsement, uh, which I'm going to wear like a badge of courage now. Um, Republican Party is so broken. I know where the Democrats are coming from. What I'm so fearful for is my own party. When Romney lost, I had a decision to make, and I worked so hard in that election, uh, but I was tone deaf, ladies and gentlemen. At that point in time, I had a decision to make. I had a decision to walk away from all of it and just go home and be a stay-at-home person, or I could try to learn. What, what, what wasn't I hearing? What was missing? So that's when I wound up coming to 912, and I started going to different groups listening to people, listening to people. Because you know what? Matt, Sheck, and I agree on one thing. We have to continue to talk, political discourse. If we quit talking, it's over. I'm really, really disappointed in our GOP, and I've been a GOP person for years. I love the Republican Party. We've just gotten off base. We need to get it back on course. And uh, that's the way I feel, and uh, I think there's some good people that are working diligently to make that happen. Okay, one minute, 29.6 seconds. Real good. Okay, um, just rapid fire, a couple of pointed questions. You can say yes, no, or what the answer is, real quick, and we'll just pass it back and forth. Do you consider yourself to be a a uh, Tea Party Republican, a conservative Republican, a libertarian Republican, uh, a moderate, or just a platform Republican? I don't like labels. I am who I am. I'm a hard worker. I have to say, if you want to categorize me, I would say I am a, a Ronald Reagan conservative and uh, greatest president in my lifetime. 
I'd like to emulate myself uh, from that uh, after President Reagan. Um, but uh, labels, I don't like to, I don't give anybody else a label and I don't like one on myself. Reagan Republican, thank you. <laughs> um, I suppose you could, could count me as a Libertarian Republican. I, uh, I also don't like labels, but I mean, I guess it is what it is. I, uh, I, was, I was very disgusted with the GOP for a long time in college, and then, but the Tea Party really allowed me to come back in, so, but I still consider myself more of a Libertarian than anything else. Okay, next question that uh, we got on the radio uh, to ask you guys. Um, there seems to be um, a movement going on here in Northern Michigan, especially in the 105, the 107, the race that's going on up there between Lee Chatfield and Frank Foster, the race that's going on between Wayne Schmidt and, and Greg McMaster in the Senate. But there seems to be a consensus that the first congressional district is starting to lean a little bit more um, fiscally responsible, a little bit more conservative, getting away from Bart Stupak, um, even now uh, Congressman Benishek's being primary challenged by Alan Arcan. Do you see this type of conservative trending here in North, Northern Michigan? And uh, do you make yourself to be part of that or do you don't see uh, us really going that conservative based on all these other races? So. Uh, it's definitely more conservative every day. Uh, when I go to state conventions uh, and observe, it's more conservative all the time, which is a really, really good thing from my perspective. Um, but yes, it's, it's a more conservative message. But, but furthermore, if I might just take a, an extra second or two here. When, when I talk to people, you know, they're not at the door or on the phone. They're not asking, well, are, who do you, how do you consider yourself? Well, what, what level are you at? They go, are you going to do the work for us? Can we trust you? If we send you to Lansing, they don't really care. Are you conservative, Tea Party, this? Can you do the work? Can we trust you? And you know what? I've even sw spoken with a couple Democrats that said, yeah, Karen, we think we can trust you. So that's, that's if that makes any sense. So that's the way I feel. One minute, Rob. What was the question? <laughs> First district. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Are we getting more conservative? Are, are, do you feel we are, and, and do you yeah. relate to that? I I usually take I, mean, I always take the long view. When you know when I look at anything from interest rates to politics, I'm looking at 50, 100 year swaths of time. And what we what, what always happens in politics is there's the pendulum swing. It goes back and forth. Uh, Michigan got really liberal under Granholm. We had lots of taxes. The economy got terrible. People realized, oh, all this socialist stuff ain't working. Now we're swinging back to more conservative. So yeah, I believe, and I believe, uh, I'm fighting for a more conservative Michigan. I'm trying to get the conservative message out there uh, because I believe being fiscally responsible is what leads to prosperity. However, um, you know, you, if I had 10 minutes instead of one, you could talk about the cycle of the body politic and how it always comes back around. But uh, it, it is a cycle, and I, I do see we're in a conservative swing right now. Do you relate to that? Are you, are you part of that, do you think? Or? Yeah, as I said, uh, I am promoting the conservative agenda, and uh, fiscal, fiscal conservatism leads to prosperity. Good. Yeah, I'd have to agree, at least on the fiscal conservative side, uh, especially from people from my generation, um, in terms of what they want to see government spent on. Um, a lot of my generation has supported, or would, they'd support Obamacare, but once they get to the numbers, um, that tends to tell a little bit different story, at least from what I've experienced. Um, my generation is more, is very much along the lines that I've seen, starting to trend to, we want government to spend less, and we want them out of our lives. Um, and that, that's especially true up here, more than, more than probably any other place that I've been recently. Um, so in terms of fiscally conservative, I absolutely agree with that, and I would be on that side. Very good. OK, if uh, there's no other questions uh, from the audience, it's uh, 2.40, and uh, we've had a, you know, a lot of questions here with just three candidates, with all the other candidates not showing up. Um, does anybody else have any questions there that they would like to have me ask these guys? If not, um, 
what I will do is, she's using it as a fan instead of giving me a question, so. Oh, you already, these were yours? Okay. <laughs> what I, I'll do then is uh, close um, this with uh, you guys giving a two minute closing statement. Uh, these are some of your voters. That camera is gonna be probably reaching out to a lot of folks uh, who are gonna see this video. Why should the people on August 5th, whether they be Republicans or Democrat, Independence, moderate, Tea Party, establishment, whatever. Why should they vote for you on August 5th in this primary? And we'll start with Matt. Yeah, well, uh, the, reason, uh, the reason that you should vote for me is because I'm going to be a different politician. Um, I'm not very buttoned down. I'm not, I'm not somebody that's not approachable. I'm not somebody that, that buys into special interests or, or even treats them with any kind of respect. Um, and I think that's important because I understand that you're my boss, not these other people. And that's, I think, the biggest, biggest problem with, with uh, you know, with people in Lansing today. Not just from up here, not just Wayne, everybody. They, they buy into this when, in reality, if we just stood up and said, hey, we're only going to elect people that are going to represent us and not these special interests, then we're then we'd be we'd be we'd be so fine. We would be absolutely in the best position available. Um, so no, I don't buy that necessarily that we have to play this game that uh, the way that it's been played forever and ever because we've been screwed forever and ever. Um, so even the best players in the game haven't been able to help us. So what you're going to get from me is somebody that's open, is honest, uh, says what he thinks, is a straight shooter, and is really funny. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, expect, expect lots of jokes and lots of laughs because, um, you know, if I, please, gov government is not something that is, that is respectable in any, in any regard. So, uh, <laughs> and anybody that says otherwise is a fool or a liar. So that's, that's, why you should, that's why you should vote for me. I mean, I, I have conservative principles, all that, but, uh, but the real issue is I'm going, to, I'm going to be working for you, not for special interests. Thanks. Okay, let me reset this. And uh, Rob, why don't you go two minutes? Okay. Why should people vote for you on August 5th? Okay, well, uh, in politics, in a race, it's really, it's one of the most challenging things a person can do because you have to talk about yourself. And that's usually socially really um, a terrible thing to do is to always talk about yourself. Um, but, you know, I, I, I said something last night, and I'll, I'll say it again today. What you do speaks so loud what you say, I can't hear. That's what we need to look at when we're looking at people we're sending to Lansing, okay? I'm a, uh, so anyone in this race, there's lots of people that are gonna say a lot of the same things, but look at what they do to consider about what they're going to be doing if elected. Um, a little more about myself, you know, yeah, I grew up in a, a small business right here in Grand Travers County. I've got three kids at home. When this is all said and done, that's what I get to come back to. I'm, I, I don't have a jet plane warmed up on the runway and waiting in case this falls through, like some candidates have said they have. Um, that, you know, that if it doesn't work, they're out of here. Um, no, but whatever, whatever happens to Michigan, whatever happens to Grand Chambers County, I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna live with it, uh, for better or worse. I'm gonna be here trying to make this a better place, whether I'm in Lansing, whether I'm here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the, I've been spent the last few years as secretary of the Traverse City Rotary Club, uh, volunteered for many organizations. I'm you know, a member of the NRA, a member of the uh, Buckley Old Engine Show, the, the uh, Northwest Michigan Fair. Um, you know, I, I flip burgers at the NMC Barbecue. That's the kind of person I am. And I'm inviting you to send that kind of person to Lansing because I really care about people and I really care about our area and what's going to happen here. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity, Randy. Uh, it's just been great. And uh, the reason why I would like to ask humbly for your support in sending me to Lansing is, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've, I've had a varied career. I think we're in challenging times. I know, we, I know Charlie and I are challenged every day, trying to keep our head above water, owning our small business. Um, if you don't have any experience in business, how can you think for one minute you can go to Lansing and enact legislation, write it, stop it, read it, if you have never walked in the shoes of a business person? 
you can't do it. You can't do it well. Additionally, uh, I'm a registered nurse. I have a, a, a perspective in this race that none of the other candidates have. This is a real hot button issue right now with people's health care, and I think it's critical to have somebody with that perspective going forward. Uh, I'll give you a, one little cliche that I, I have. It's a cliche, but it's so true. It really resonates. And I've said it to some groups that being a registered nurse means if you're honest with the patient, you will tell the patient, this won't be easy. And the days ahead may be painful. And likewise, they will be in Lansing because, ladies and gentlemen, we're broken here. There's pain. But the registered nurse, and if that is how I, it was going to stand by your side every single day to make sure, and you can be trustworthy, of, you can put your trust in me. I too, like Rob, I love this community. It's the greatest place on the face of the earth. I've given to the community in volunteerism. Uh, it's beautiful, we have the natural resources, but the best part are the people, and I will do anything for them. Thank you. Very good, perfect. You have an internal timer going in your head. <laughs> Okay, folks, well, for the uh, people here, thank you very much for taking, you know, two hours of your day on a Saturday to come and be a part of this. I want to thank um, Matt Lundy, Rob Henschel, and Karen Rennie for, for attending this, this forum. Um, I volunteered my time to provide this as a public service to the people here in Grand Traverse County, even though I'm not a resident of the county anymore. And honestly, folks, I'm a little bit disappointed that Larry Inman, Isaiah Wunsch, Jamie Callahan, and Bo Vore, and Ken Hinton, especially the Republicans, as well as Betsy, who I reached out to, and Penny, um, couldn't take the time out of their day, their campaign, and what other events they have going on to, you know, face these questions. Were they fair? Were they relevant? Yes. Were they informative? Yes. So why would these candidates choose, and this was a choice, these three people chose to come here, sit in these chairs, and answer these questions for you, the people? Why would they choose? And, I, and I, I guess I, all I can say is, share this video, Jason, with as many people as you can get this information out to the people of the 104th because we are at a crossroads and i'll be very blunt i left this county because i felt it was too liberal for my taking i moved to antrim and i'm very proud to say that we know that the 104th has the potential to send a good strong candidate to lansing to join this team that we're trying to put together here in northern michigan it's your responsibility to get this information out, share it on Facebook, email it to all your friends, but more importantly, let them make an informed decision a week from Tuesday. That's what it's coming down to. And if one of these other candidates who did not have the respect of your time to come and face these questions, which I really don't think they were that tough. If you're running for elected office, you should have been able to answer every single one of these questions. Why? Did Larry Inman not want to be here? Isaiah, Jamie Callahan, Bo Vore. I'm extremely disappointed in them personally. And in my opinion, you should be too. These three should be considered because they were respectful of the community, they were respectful of your time, and they were willing to face the hard questions. And I guess that's all I have to say. But uh, again, thank you for coming. Have a blessed day.